Nehemiah 8. I think I surprised my wife. I don't think she'd seen this necktie before. And I, I might have seemed a little too bright to her when I came home from work today. As a joke of the fellow that was in a suit and tie, and he came in and said, I just attended the funeral of an old fellow friend of mine from high school, known him over 50 years. The second guy said, that's a rather bright necktie, isn't it? And the man says, well, I didn't like him very much. I need a rim shot somewhere. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 8, bless you. Nehemiah 8, and we're going to pick up at verse 13, but before we do, I want you to look up at chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. And Jeshua, and Bani, and Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodijah, Maasiah, Kalida, Azariah, Jozabad, Canaan, Peleiah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. Look down also at verse 12. <clears throat> All the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth. Why? Because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Go forward in the New Testament to the book of Acts chapter 17. Acts 17. And verses 2 and 3. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days, that would be three weeks, three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging, that to open the Scriptures, and alleging means to draw, distinct, draw conclusions based on what's being read that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Look down also at verses 10 and 11. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These, the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Go, if you will, back to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. And uh, verse 27. Luke 24, 27, and beginning at, with, at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Look down at verses 31 and 32. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. That's Jesus after his resurrection. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures, look forward at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 3. Notice there verses 14 and 15. 2 Timothy 3 verses 14 and 15. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing whom thou hast learned them. Well, excuse me, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Notice 
in none of these texts that we've just read is anything said about the original manuscripts or someone having to be an Aramaic or Hebrew linguist or having to have the right lexicon to give them the proper definition of words. Um, it's a safe bet that when Timothy was a child, verse 15 here, he didn't have the original documents written by any of the prophets. Not a single text indicates that. Look at verse 16. Right in the context, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. In all of those references, the scriptures refer to the copy of the words that someone had, to the uh, words, the copies of the words that they uh, possessed in their hands, had access to. The copies available, never to some long lost, dusty, original manuscripts that nobody's ever discovered. Never refers to that. To claim you believe in the inspiration of the Bible and cite 2 Timothy 3.16 as a proof text. To claim you believe in the inspiration of the Bible, but you don't believe in the preservation of the Bible by the hand and the direction and the providence of God, that's the real heresy. To say, I believe the scriptures were inspired, but uh, they weren't preserved. If the scriptures were only the original manuscripts once upon a time, and no one has ever found the original manuscripts, then we can safely say the scriptures don't exist, do they? But they do. We believe with all our hearts that they do. And we believe that, that the copy of it we hold in our hands by the providence of God has been preserved exactly as God wants us to have it, to read it, to hear it, to hold it, the vocabulary he wants us to memorize. And as I said recently, I don't even believe in changing the punctuation. Leave that alone, too. You see an italicized word. When the King James translators didn't have a, couldn't direct, uh, translate directly from Hebrew into English or Greek into English, and they needed something to smooth out the, the sense of that verse, they would add a few words and supply those words in italics. That's the story behind any italicized words you find in your Bible. I don't even believe in changing those because we have the book exactly as God saw fit to give it to us over 400 years ago. And, um, you know, you, you, you hear these advertisements, you read these advertisements, you know, for a car, for something else. You've tried the rest, now try the best. And th these ads for modern versions of the Bible, modern translations, are always trying to, they're always claiming to make it clearer and plainer and update the previous hundred translations that came out, each one of them claiming to update the ones before them. I was down at this big Calvary Chapel, not far from here, and they have a big Christian, you know, Christian religious bookstore on the premises. And I wandered through there, and they're advertising some modern version of the Bible, and I didn't have time to read the details or read the brochure, but the, their marketing advertisement was, what if there was one Bible to do it all? Yeah, what if? What if? Well, we believe there is. <laughs> and uh, no man, Dr. Ruckman, who I admired so much and taught me the Bible, had read through the Bible just, just reading it from cover to cover at least 150 times in the years he was saved. That's not studying it. That's not going through topical studies and studying a certain a subject matter, certain doctrines. That's just reading it for his own edification. And he says, no man has ever mastered the, the Bible. And I believe that. No man or woman has ever mastered the book, but it's certainly possible. But you and I don't live long enough to, <laughs> to do that. And uh, only with the Holy Spirit's help can we learn anything. And um, But uh, all those references, none of them have anything to do with having to know the original Greek or Hebrew in order to understand the Bible given to you in English. Um, Alan uh, and Priscilla, they're both uh, 
Spanish speakers, and Bonnie, she's, she and I are sort of quasi-Spanish speakers, we're trying. But in order to translate something from English into Spanish, it's necessary for, in order for it to make sense in, the Span in Spanish, you have to somehow, sometimes um, change the syntax. In English, we say the White House. In Spanish, it's uh, La Casa Blanca, right? The House White. So sometimes you change the order of the words. You might have to add something or uh, um, ignore or, or uh, not include something for it to make sense to a Spanish reader. And yet, are you going to tell me that that can't be just as inspired for the person reading it in Spanish who needs to have it in Spanish as the one in English? God's a big God. If God can... Uh, multiply the tongues of men at the Tower of Babel. And if he can give them the word of God and allow men to begin speaking in other languages on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, then God won't have any trouble in keeping his book preserved, whether it's in English or Spanish or French or Hungarian or Portuguese. And this is what we believe as Bible believers. Right, let's go back to our text, Hebrew, or Nehemiah 8. Let's pick up our text, verses 13 through 15. And on the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month, and that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mount, and fetch all branches, and pine branches, and myrtle branches, and palm branches, and branches of thick trees, to make booths, as it is written. <clears throat> what they found written, you and I can also find written. I want you to go back to Leviticus chapter 23. Here's the source of it, Leviticus chapter 23, Leviticus 23 and verse 34, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, the fifteenth of the seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles, for seven days unto the Lord. Also look down at verse 42. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. <clears throat> the Feast of Tabernacles was commanded for the seventh month on the Jewish calendar. According to God, the seventh month is not our month of July, which we're in now, and that would be number seven on our calendar. The old world calendars, before Western societies began to change around, rename the months, had September as the seventh month of the calendar. As and there are and the roots of the word still remain. September, October, November, December. That means seven, eight, nine, ten. Or in Spanish, siete, ocho, nueve días, right? So the roots of the words still remain, uh, even though here in the Western world, world, we call those months 9, 10, 11, 12. In the old world calendars, they would have been 7, 8, 9, and 10. And to confirm the Bible's commandments concerning this, nearly every state in the Union invites people, invites business merchants to set up booths as they're called in verse 16 of our text, uh, from which to sell their wares and do business. Every year it's called the county fair. And it all happened in the late fall, September, October. You've heard the radio commercials for the Orange County Fair. The LA County Fair will be coming up soon. And uh, I mean, you can't, how do you, how do you beat that? If God sends out something that seems to confirm which month is the seventh month? Only modern man likes to mess around with it, must ignore it. 
Back to our text, verses 16 through 18. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, every one upon the roof of his house and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the street of the water gate and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. And all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Jeshua, that would have been Joshua, the son of Nun, unto the day, excuse me, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so, and there was very great gladness. Also, day by day, from the first day unto the last day, he read in the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day was a solemn assembly, according unto the manner. The use of the word tabernacle, or, or booths, as they're also called, throughout the Word of God, is going to give us an insight as to the time of the second advent of Jesus Christ, His glorious, re visible return at the end of the tribulation, and Israel's reinstatement to prominence under the uh, reign of the Messiah. Uh, but before I go any further with that, go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians, the New Testament, chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and notice what Paul writes for this cause also <clears throat> thank we God without ceasing because when you received the word of God which ye heard of us ye received it not as the word of men but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe which means you can hear the Bible and read the Bible and uh, listen to the Bible uh, read to you. You can memorize parts of the Bible, but unless you believe what you're reading to be the words of God, they won't work. They won't bear the kind of fruit uh, in you that God wants it to bear. It won't take root. It won't change you in any way. It won't convict you when the Holy Spirit's trying to stir your heart, stir your mind, conscience about something that needs to be changed, something that needs to be altered because of your actions, some sin that needs to be confessed to God, something that needs to be brought back and uh, yielded to the Lord Jesus Christ. Unless you're believing that what you're reading uh, are the words of God, they won't bear that kind of fruit in you. The Lord gave ten commandments, not ten suggestions. You can't treat the Bible as simply... Well, that's your opinion, and I'll think about it later. No, you fix it right now. If you really believe it, fix it now. And I think I said a few weeks back, it's a free country. Uh, you can use any version of the Bible you want.